Hello everybody and welcome back to the channel. Today we will be listening to the fifth part of what if Deku became an analyst. If you enjoy, please consider liking, commenting, and subscribing down below. Now, without further ado, let's get into the video. Chapter 32, Preparing for the Future. Shouto sat in his seat, trying to focus on the conversation with his friends rather than memories of the incident a few days ago. Inaza was trying to convince Tinya that the ocean was a soup, with Yeomomo trying to get Inaza to change the topic. Shouto was just trying to keep his laughter in. Although it was kind of hard to laugh when they were all worried. None of them had heard from Izuku since the incident, and they were all hoping he was okay. The conversation was abruptly cut off when the door opened, and he could see his classmates all scramble for their seats. When the door was fully opened, in entered a mummy wrapped in bandages, with a raccoon wearing a hat perched on his shoulder. Good, you hellions are learning. Izawa sensei. All right, this is Pickles and Wendy, they will be going with you today. Kigo watched as his brother placed a raccoon with a green hat on Izawa's shoulder, and a raccoon with a red hat went on Kigo's shoulder. Which ones are these ones? Kigo asked, slowly and carefully moving to give the raccoon scratches under his chin. He was trying not to pull any of his stitches, and he could see that Izawa was keeping deadly still while the raccoon sniffed him. First mate Pickles of the 1st Raccoon Battalion is with Uncle Shouta, and first mate Wendy of the 4th Raccoon Battalion is with Kigo. WH there's first mates now. There's always been first mates, Izuku crossed his arms with a pout. Anyways, don't do anything stupid. They will be texting me, Nezu or Auntie Kana. You taught them to text. Problem child, is this really necessary? A kid holding two baby raccoons to his chest like children should not be scary, but the death glare he gave both of them definitely struck the fear of the kami into Kigo's soul. I can't believe Izawa sensei came to school. Inaza shouted, wiping a fake tear from his eyes. Such passion. It's super manly. Kiri's Hima added, giving the other kid a fist bump. Introducing those two was a mistake. It's super stupid, Jiro grumbled. He should be resting. Hitashi nodded, still chugging water. He'd just gotten his ass handed to him in a spar with Aitza, and he was more interested in making sure to stay hydrated than participate in conversation. What was up with the raccoon though? Hagakure asked, while she was doing warm-ups for her spar with Inaza. He was wearing a green hat and I'm pretty sure I saw him texting. Ah yes, a member of the raccoon battalion, Todoroki nodded, as if that explained jack shit. Hitashi just groaned, making sure to do his cool down stretches. It'll still hurt like a bitch, but hopefully stretching will keep it from hurting for a week as opposed to a couple of days. Hagakure and Kiri's Hima were worried about Midoriya, so they were staying after school to check up on the crazy bastard, he and Jiro were just there for moral support. Turns out that the other group of Midoriya's friends, the rec students, were also doing the same thing, so they decided to train together while they waited for the green idiot. Despite still being mostly annoying, Yeyorozu was chill, they did actually have some good advice. I'm sorry but what the fuck? Jiro asked. You can't just say that without explanation. No, that is the explanation. Yeah, it's really surprising that Izuku managed to teach raccoons to text, Momo piped up, like she wasn't just dropping a bombshell. Midoriya what? I didn't do anything this time I swear. Everyone turned to see Midoriya running towards them, with the other crazy bastard following behind him. Hitashi got a split second to see him before multiple people rushed him and he was tackled to the ground in a group hug. I'm fine. I'm fine. After a few minutes of frantic sobbing and reassurances, the pile of students was very slowly pulled apart. Midoriya was still patting a sobbing Kiri's Hima on the back. I'm fine, I promise. He turned to Todoroki and Hagakure. Are you two alright? Todoroki just nodded. Hagakure sniffled, but also nodded. Just sore, but I'm fine. Are you okay though? Todoroki asked. I mean your mother dash. I'm fine. Midoriya coughed awkwardly. I'm fine. Everything's fine. Hats a mouth from behind him, he's not fine. How is Takumai sensei doing? Momo asked, smoothly changing the topic. He's doing better. He's still upset about not being able to fly, but he should be back in the air soon. We're all glad you and Takumai sensei are alright, Aitsa said. Thanks, and sorry about not answering your texts. It's been. 
Don't worry about it dude, Kiri's Hima spoke up. Taking care of yourself is manly. As the conversation trailed off, everyone started kind of looking at each other. We were training for the festival, Aitza broke the awkward silence. Do you want to help? We've been taking turns sparring, and you always have good advice for us. Midoriya gave them a small smile. Sure. I'm super excited for the sports festival. Hatsum shouted, plopping down next to Midoriya. I'll be able to show off all my babies. Yeah. Inaza shouted. I'm super pumped to show off my heroic spirit. I forgot that support students could participate, Jiro muttered. Midoriya, are you dash? I'm not participating. The entire gym went silent. He pulled out a notebook, just labeled analysis on the spine. I have to focus on my work. I can't afford to get distracted. While his classmates were trying to figure out what to do, Hitashi slipped out of the gym unnoticed. Taking a few steps away from the door, he pulled out his phone and scrolled through his contacts, hitting call. Maybe his mother would know how to arrange an intervention. May watched her friend from the staircase to the roof, using her quirk to observe him without being spotted. Izuka was sitting on a blanket, typing away on his laptop while muttering and going through his notebook. Despite it being their lunch period, he had no food, and May knew that he didn't eat beforehand. She's noticed this the past few days. Izuka would go up to the roof and work during lunch. When they have free time, Izuka is working. Hell, Izuka's been skipping out on hanging out with the rest of their friends to work. May and her friends haven't been able to stop him, so it was time to call the cavalry. She went down the stairs, practically sprinting to the teacher's lounge. She slammed the door open, startling multiple teachers, and she swore that a mug went flying. I need help. It's about Izuku. Chapter 33, Intervention. Kigo wanted to help set up, he really did. However, since he was still recovering from the fuckery of the USJ, he was assigned the task of supervising which really meant sit to the side while everyone else set things up. At least by the sounds Izawa was making, he wasn't pleased to be benched either. Rumi and Tensei were arranging the room, dragging out chairs to surround a small table they stole from the teacher's lounge. Kayama and Yamato were running errands, while Fuku Kato and Tsutsumi were on distraction duty. We're back. Yamato shouted, holding a giant box. I got the cake. And I got the baby. Kayama grinned, holding up Susi. Give her to me. Kigo responded, smiling when the heroine handed him the cat. She was purring in his arms, and he swore up and down that her purring was healing him. Mirai, Neyamesa, and Nezu can't make it, but they wish us good luck, Kayama said, supporting Rumi as she hung up the banner. They're currently working on the league case. We've got this. Tensei shouted. We have cake and a cat, what else do we need? Kigo felt buzzing next to him and opened up his phone to see a text from Fuku Kato. They're coming. Everyone else quickly scrambled to take their places, trying to act casual. But Rumi was nervously thumping her foot, and Kigo himself was preening his feathers. This had to work. Izuku had no idea where this was going. He had just finished his work on the stain case when Auntie Kena and Emi took him to Udate, dragging him onto this nature hike thing. They both insisted on not talking about work, so a lot of the conversation was spent talking about Auntie Kana getting into making stamps and Emmy's new relationship with Rumi. Then they were walking into Udate, going to one of the conference rooms instead of anywhere Izuku expected. Inside was his brother, as well as the other pros he's come to regard as family, sitting around the table with a giant tiered cake covered in green and white frosting. Written in frosting along the sides of the cake were messages like breaks are good and mental health is important and you matter, yes, smiley face included. There was a banner hanging that read take a break. Uh. Come in, sit down. Auntie Kana led him inside, making sure he took his seat in the empty chair. What's all this? We're here cause we care about you kid, Rumi said, and he could hear her tapping her foot. But I'm fine dash. Don't lie to yourself, Izawa said. Hatsum came to us yesterday and told us that you've been skipping lunch to work, Yamada said, placing a hand on Izawa's shoulder. That's not healthy, little listener. It's not Dash. You're overworking yourself, Tensei said. You need to take a break Dash. I can't. The room went silent, and Izuka caught his breath, fighting to keep tears back. I have to keep working I can't stop. 
I, I can't lose anyone else. He looked up when he felt Izawa's mummified hand on his shoulder. Kid, we all get it. All of us had tried to bury ourselves in our work to cope with something. Everyone around him was nodding. Izuku felt a wing wrap around his shoulders, and he looked up at Kigo on his other side. We all had to learn the hard way that it wasn't healthy. We don't want that for you, fled Gellying. I dash words were caught in his throat. What do I do, if I'm not? We all have different hobbies that make us happy, Emmy said, lifting her face into a smile. When I have time I go hiking. I host the radio show, but I also like messing around and making music of my own, Yamada said, which got some annoyed grumbling from Izawa. Show takes care of his fur babies. He has seven, and they're all named Bastard, Kayama said with a wink. That got a laugh out of Izuku. Hell, we've even gotten Birdbrain over here into hobbies. Rumi grinned, as if it was a great achievement. Which to be fair, it was. I've been finger painting birds, Kigo smiled. He raised an eyebrow. So you can add to the atrocious number of bird paintings in your agency. His brother slumped dramatically onto Rumi as everyone else laughed. Of course, this did disturb the cat on his lap, who instead hopped onto Izuku's lap. He had just noticed that Susi was here, and was delighted. I guess I care for the plants. He said hesitantly, stroking Susi. But I don't know if that counts. And the raccoon army doesn't count either, Kigo said. Because I know you're using them to gather information to do more work. When Izuku didn't really say anything, Auntie Kana spoke up. Here's what we all decided, you're gonna stop working for the next few weeks, until after the sports festival. You will spend that time hanging out with your friends, trying out hobbies, doing normal teenager stuff. You are still doing your schoolwork though, Yamada said. That's non-negotiable. And you can do some analysis for your friends. Emmy spoke up. Just no cases, no heroes. Dekaru is on a mental health break. What if there are urgent cases dash? Then another analyst can work on it, Rumi said. You may be one of the best in the business, but there are other analysts. The world will be fine if you take a break, I promise. Izuku sighed. Unfortunately, his older sister had a point. I don't know what to do. We'll help Broccoli Chan, don't worry. Kayama reached over the table to ruffle his hair. You're not alone. As the other heroes around the table all said, or shouted, their agreements, Izuku wiped away a couple of tears. Thanks, guys. It's what family's for, Kigo said, using his wing to pull him into a side hug. All right, now that the intervention's over, it's time for cake. Kayama shouted, pulling out a knife and starting to slice into it. Yes, and it's also time for my other ulterior motive. Emmy shouted, standing up and pulling out a duffel bag from under the table. How did you dash what? When did you have time to hide that? With a dramatic flourish, Emmy continued. We haven't been able to just hang out in forever, so I decided that it's time for a board game day. When the bag was opened, Auntie Kana looked in the bag, then wrinkled her nose and looked back up at Emmy. Monopoly, really? Are you trying to get us to kill each other? As the rest of the heroes started arguing, Kayama handed Izuku his slice of cake with a wink. He offered it to Susie to sniff, and took a bite when she decided she wasn't interested. With a smile, he bit into delicious minty cake with chocolate chips, and watched in amusement as the heroes argued between exploding kittens and munchkin. He was surrounded by family, with a delicious cake and a purring cat in his lap. For the moment, all was right with the world. Chapter 34, Get Ready, Get Set Tensei stretched out his back, watching as Rumi dragged Stain away, who was incapacitated by laughter. As they passed, Rumi gave Emmy a quick kiss on the cheek. The heroine sighed, unsubtle watching her girlfriend's butt. I love that woman. He sighed, waving at his sidekicks who were talking to the police. Some of us are single, Emmy. That sounds like a you problem, Tensei, she shot back, skipping backwards. Now come on. The sooner we finish patrolling, the sooner we can go visit Broccoli Chan. And your brother too. Tensei accepted the water bottle that Big Shot handed him, patting his sidekick on the back. All right, but you're helping me on the report when we get back. But I've got a date with Rumi tonight. That sounds like a you problem, Emmy. Midoriya, right. Izuku turned around, 
coming face to face with an older management student. Her eyes were shining as she looked at him, her hair flashing all sorts of different colors. Not waiting for an answer, she held out her hand. Ira Hanka O'Kane from 3J. You're the first analysis student in the support course in like forever, and the rumors say that you're psychic and you can tell how to kill a man at a glance. UMM, well I'm not psychic and legally I can't answer the second one, but I am Midoriya, yes. His head was spinning from everything that was happening. Do me. Do me. The only reason he wasn't internally combusting was because he's been friends with Mei for so long, but his face was still bright red. Presuming she wanted an on-the-spot analysis, he blurted out, I need money first. Which wow, what an unfortunate statement to default to. He might be spending a little bit too much time with Kiko, because she simply laughed and grabbed his arm. Yeah that's fair. It wouldn't be as valuable if you didn't charge. She grinned, dragging him off. Now normally, we only let management students in, but you get to be an exception. Alright you have to tell me up front where we're going, because I want to make sure I'm not about to be murdered. Without giving him an answer, she opened up an unlabelled door. Going through it, he was suddenly transported to some sort of American noir bar, with a combination of a pool and poker table, an ice cooler filled with sparkling grape juices, and a TV with footage of the sports festival playing. The management students were all swishing their mock champagne in fancy plastic glasses and eating cinnamon sticks pretending they were cigars. Everyone was at least wearing some sort of fedora, and Ira Hanka put one on his head, pulling another one out of her hair to put on her head. They really knew how to stick to an aesthetic, he'll give them that. I brought the Midoriya. He grinned, adjusting the hat on his head. Well I didn't know I was the Midoriya. He was herded to the table, as everyone gathered around while the reporters prattled on about the sports festival. There were standard playing cards spread out across the surface, but the faces of students were cut out and duct taped to them. Someone had dragged a literal pot out of the kitchen, and it was filled with snacks that were probably bought from various vending machines throughout the school. Welcome to the betting table, an older student said, who he presumed to be the ringleader of this underground betting ring because he had the fanciest hat. Put your ante in and make your bets. He pulled out a bag of choco cats that he had snagged from the vending machine beforehand, being handed a handful of poker chips. With a grin, he started placing them on top of participants. The pot was his. Young Hagakure, a moment. Tora turned around, giving a beaming smile to her mentor. Hi Yagi Sensei. He put his hands on her shoulder, giving a giant grin back. How do you feel, my girl? I'm so nervous, she admitted, wringing out her hands. I'm still getting used to using one for all, and I still haven't perfected warp refraction. I'm not ready. No one ever feels ready for their first sports festival, Yagi said. I sure didn't when I was your age. He released his grip on her shoulders, flexing and suddenly turning into buff might. But rest assured, you are ready. Go out there, young Hagakure, and show the world that you are here. The optimism was infectious, and she flexed in return. I am here. She stumbled when Yagi patted her on the back, putting a little too much strength into it. That's my girl. Now get out there and show them who you are. Tora turned around, giving her mentor a quick wave as he deflated, before turning around and booking it to the waiting room. Every second matters. In the 1B waiting room, Minoma Nieto and Kendu Itsuka are rallying their class. In order to get higher and ensure that members of 1B make it to the final bracket, the entire class is working together. While Minoma's main selling point is to crush 1A, their rivals, most of the class was persuaded by Kendu's reasoning that getting further into the festival means more attention from pros. And those who weren't were convinced by Pony's promise to treat the class to ice cream if they worked together. Meanwhile, in the one awaiting room, the class and vice class representatives were committing the same rallying. Their class was unique, and no one else from the other classes would understand what it's like to truly fear for their lives. To no one's surprise, it was another one of Inez's heartfelt speeches about passion and heroism that really convinced the class to work together. From his tiny office, the brain of the security system working to protect UA, Nedzu cackled. This year's sports festival was going to be very interesting. Chapter 35, Go. Tora never realized how much her cheerleading training would come in handy. For example, when Todoroki froze the gateway, freezing their competition to the ground, she instinctively turned her jump into a split jump. And while the rest of her class used their quirks to leap over the competition, 
or just straight up bodied them, Tora treated the unfortunate kids who were frozen down as pommel horses, launching herself forwards. While it was very skillful and pretty cool, if you asked her, she could physically feel the middle finger that Hitachi was giving her. She hit the ground running, sprinting with the rest of her class. She was near the back of the group, but she didn't mind. The most important thing is that they all made it to the next round. She was very confident about how the race was going. Keyword being was. What the fuck? What the fuck? First, Todoroki freezes the entrance to the ground, which was cool for all the kids with quirks that allowed them to get over the ice, and Hagakure apparently. Next, they make him run, and he's kicking himself for not doing enough cardio. And now they have the audacity to have multiple zero pointers in their way. At least he wasn't the only one who was a little pissed. The rec students looked shocked, like they haven't seen these spawn of Satan before. He and Jiro exchanged a glance, and she looked just as done as he did. For a solid few seconds, they all just stared at the army in disbelief. Then it looked like the class reps got their act together, because Aitza was shouting something to Anaza, and students were being launched by the wind into the air. Don't you dare dash he definitely did not scream as he was launched into the air. He definitely did not cling to Kiri's him out of fear while they flew over the zero pointers. And he was definitely not laughed at by his very supportive friends. Hopefully the cameras weren't recording him, because otherwise that was blackmail material for life. Hypothetically of course, because none of that happened. He did take Kirishima's offer of a piggyback ride. Purely to avoid running. Not for any other reason, Jiro, stop laughing. Shouto slid on the ground, doing what Izuku would call a Tokyo Drift as he landed. Because of Inaza's winds, he was launched a good way, only a few meters away from the next section. He vaguely remembered Izuku's brother muttering something about HPSC health violations for the regular entrance exam, and that memory was ripped from the back of his mind. He was facing a seemingly bottomless pit, with thin tight ropes running between the platforms connecting from one side to the other. He knew Tinya, Inaza, and Momo would be able to get across no problem, but the rest of his class wouldn't. And they all agreed to work together, so he probably shouldn't just strand them. Making a flame with his left hand so that he wasn't frozen solid, he started running across the pit, a bridge of ice forming underneath his feet. When he made it to the other side, he stopped at the edge, getting down on one knee to wait for the rest of his class. While he tracked the faces of his friends and classmates, he used the breather to warm up his left side. It wouldn't do to get hurt in the first round because he was being reckless with his quirk. When the last person went across, Kauda, if he remembered correctly, he stood up. They hadn't talked about sabotaging the rest of their competition, but Shouto wasn't about to take any chances. He released a bright flame, watching the bridge melt behind him, stranding the other students who managed to make it past the zero pointers. He recognized some of the rude gestures being pointed in his direction, especially from the two students who were on the bridge before it melted, and just gave them a salute. Turning on his heel, he started catching up to his classmates. He'd secured himself a solid 20th place, and he's determined to keep his class ahead of 20th and everyone else behind it. What did his friends say? He's gaslight, gatekeep, girl bossing. A minefield where the steps have to be precise or you explode, where the mines are evenly spaced and if someone was paying close attention, they can tell where the mines were buried. Toru was considering asking Nezu if he knew her old coach. Bumu sensei would have cried if she were here. One, two, three, four. She started shouting the UA spirit theme, launching forwards into a handspring. Despite not having done the routine in years, muscle memory carried her forwards. She cartwheeled, vaulted, and flipped across the field, chanting the theme at the top of her lungs, all without ever disturbing the dirt that covered the mines. You dot a. She stuck the landing of the backflip, holding her hands up, when she heard a massive explosion behind her. With her jaw on the floor, Toru watched as Todoroki flew over all of their heads, not using his quirk to propel himself further. She tracked the arc he made as he flew over the course, gliding into Anaza's back and sending them both tumbling over the finish line. Do I even want to know? She asked to the wind. Real rich coming from the girl who just did an entire fucking cheerleading routine across a minefield, Hitashi snarked, clinging onto Kirishima's back for dear life. The other boy's face looked like it was slowly changing colors. Need to breathe dash Kiri's him a wheezed. Leaving the disaster gaze to whatever was happening, she instead turned on her heel and started running. It was just a straight shot to the finish line, which she didn't mind. 
considering everything else, 10th place wasn't bad. Inaza was sprawled out on the ground, taking the time to catch his breath after having it knocked out of him. He had managed to secure first place, but at what cost? Next to him, Shouto was doing the same thing, only he was face down on the ground. His hair was sticking up in all sorts of directions, and he was covered in dirt and soot. Out of the corner of his eye, he saw Tinya and Momo stand over them. Shouto, what was that? When he was nudged in the side, he rolled over onto his back. I was testing one of Izuku's theories. Which one? Combining my left and right side does create an explosion. Why would you do that? Why not? Inaza reached out to give a few pats to Shouto's shoulder. That's pretty cool, but please be more careful. All they got was a thumbs up from Shouto. Tinya sighed, reaching down to help them both get up. We're still working on that. Tsuya rebated happily, ignoring a 1B kid throwing a tantrum about 1A copying their strategy, and made her way over to Habuko. You made it, Kuro. She croaked, hugging her friend. They had both been sad when Habuko didn't make it into the hero course, but she got into the gen ed program, determined to transfer in. The UA. Sports festival was her opportunity to impress the teachers, and fill the vacant spot in 1A. I was so nervous, Habuko sighed. I didn't think I'd make it. But you did. Tsuya pulled away, but she still held onto Habuko's arm. Come meet my friends, Kuro. Or are you sure? Of course. She led them towards where Shinsu was standing with Hagakure, Kiri's Hima, and Jiro. She became friends with Shinsu and Hagakure after the USJ, and she was quickly accepted into the friend group by Kiri's Hima and Jiro. They'll help you become a hero too, Kuro. We all help each other. If you're sure. With another croak, she waved to her new friends, bringing her oldest friend to meet them. She was excited for all of them to become heroes together. Chapter 36, Grudge Match Izuku. Where are you? Kigo wandered around the backstage of the arena, looking for his little brother while the students prepared for the cavalry battle. Initially, they agreed that Izuku would be sitting in the observation booth with Nezu and Yagi, but when he went up to check on them, Izuku was nowhere to be found. The only reason that Kigo wasn't freaking the fuck out was because Nezu said Izuku was fine. He was just squirreled away somewhere called the lounge. Whatever that was. Kigo. Izuku turned the corner, holding a literal pot from UA Kitchens, filled with a pile of vending machine snacks that went over his head. A little help. He sent some feathers out, stabilizing the pile of snacks and helping Izuku stand up. Now that he got closer, there was a fedora haphazardly stuck on his head with a Pokemon card tucked into the brim. Izuku, what the fuck? The kid took a deep breath in, and started talking a meter a minute. So I got kidnapped by a management student and she brought me to this place in the back of the arena I think it's called the lounge and it was decorated like some old school American bar you would see in a noir show and they basically had a betting ring for who would get what place in the obstacle course for the first round and to place bets you had to put something in the pot so I put a bag of choco cats in and all my bets were right so I won the pot and then they kicked me out. While Izuku gasped for breath, Kigo took everything in. So you found a betting ring on the results of the sports festival, and you won so they kicked you out. He nodded, and Kigo reached out to put the fedora on his head properly so it didn't fall off. Okay. Legally, I can't endorse betting, so I am glad you got kicked out. However, as your older brother, I am proud of you. Izuku beamed, still precariously balancing the snack pot in his arms. Help me bring my winnings back up to the booth. Sure thing. And tell the raccoons to get off the field. No promises. Pony skipped over to her friends. Yeo Momo, Inaza, Hatsum, and Shouto have already formed up as a team, so she went to join Setsuna and Juzu, who was talking to Tinya. I really do appreciate all of you, and I wish you the best of luck, Tinya said, arm chopping the whole time. But I must prove my mettle, and I feel as if I would be relying on you rather than standing out on my own. But isn't the whole point of a cavalry battle to help each other dash? Juzu slapped his hand over Setsuna's mouth rather rudely. I get it man, we already know each other's strategies and you gotta impress the big shots. So, is Tinya not joining us? Pony asked, walking to stand next to Setsuna. Us as in the three of us? She asked, pointing to the three of them as Tinya walked off. You joining us? Pony nodded. The point is to advance, right? 
The easiest way to do that is by working with friends. Yeah. She and Josie gave each other a little fist bump. They redid it when Setsuna also wanted to get in on the fist bump. Excuse me. They all turned around when Kendu spoke up. Do you have room for a fourth? Yeah, you can join us, Setsuna said, holding out her fist. Seal the deal. After a few awkward moments, Kendu returned the fist bump. Wait wait wait, all of us have to do it. Josie shouted, holding his arm out. We had to do this last time too, Pony explained with a shrug. Team fist bump. Once the deal was indeed sealed, they pulled Kendu into their little huddle. Got tired of raining in Manoma, huh? Setsuna asked. The other girl sighed. Yeah, I decided that he could find a team on his own. He's still complaining about Wana supposedly stealing our strategy. I'm not surprised, Josie shrugged. They have Momo in their class, and she's as smart as you are. It's pretty likely they came up with the idea independently of us. Anyways, forget about the white boy. Setsuna wrapped an arm around Pony and Josie's shoulders, officially pulling them into a huddle. We need to come up with a plan. Manoma isn't a white boy. He has the attitude of one. Fair enough. Okay, so Yurika sits on mine and Hagakura's shoulders, and she floats Shinsu, who is actually wearing the headband, up in the air, and both Yurika and Shinsu are holding a very long rope. Jiro, where would we even get the rope from? Toru asked. Aren't you friends with the weird handsome girl? Can't you ask her for one? I don't have anything to bribe her with. Also, I'm not floating in the air, Shinsu added. I will puke. Yurika, who had been silent so far, spoke up. Hagakure, if you're invisible, does anything you hold turn invisible too? Like if you're holding a rock in your hands, will the rock turn invisible? She shook her head. The only way to get the headband to be invisible would be if I ate it. And the rules clearly said that the headband had to be worn as a headband. But you can still defend yourself with warp refraction, right? That whole flashbang thing. Shinsu looked skeptical at everything that's been suggested so far. Can you even hold up that much weight with your quirk? Yeah. What do you think I've been doing at the gyms, practicing my cardio? Alright, so the only thing left is the rope, Jiro said. We don't want Hagakure floating into the sun. I'm not the only one who thinks this plan is crazy, right? Well, do you have any better ideas? Toru left Jiro and Shinsu to their bickering when she spotted a raccoon wearing a hat out of the corner of her eye. She made her way over, crouching down to the raccoon's level. Hey, can you get me a strong rope that's 10 meters long? The raccoon chittered something in response, saluted, and scurried off. Were you just talking to a raccoon? Yurika asked, catching her attention. Toru nodded. He's gonna bring us a rope. Shinsu leaned over. One of Midoriya's. He had a hat and gave me a salute, so I'm pretty sure he's one of Mito's. He sighed, covering his face with his hands. What did I get myself into? What are your predictions for the cavalry battle, Izuku? He took a sip of his tea, looking out through the glass window. He could roughly see the teams coming together, with Stanley on his lap. Manoma's team won't make it to the next round, he said, continuing to give the raccoon scratches on the head. He's gathered a good team all capable of making it, but Manoma's ego is gonna shoot them in the foot and ultimately kneecap them. Shouto's team will rely on Inaza's quirk and whatever May pulls out of her briefcase for an aerial advantage, since a large majority of the teams are on the ground. That plus Shouto's quirk means they'll get the top spot. Unlike Manoma's team, Kendu's team won't be kneecapped by ego. Plus, Juzu, Pony and Setsuna have been training together, so they'll know how to work together as a team. They won't be in the top spot, but they'll be second or third. Tinya's found a good team too. Dark Shadow is pretty powerful, and Suro's tape can pretty easily snag headbands while Dark Shadow runs distraction. Combine that with Tinya's speed and that's a recipe for easy second place. Both Manoma and Kendu will mainly be pecking off at other teams, while Inaza will be focused on keeping the 1 million while Tinya will be focused on going after them. What of young Hagakure? Yagi nervously asked, sipping on his tea. Izuku had almost forgotten he was here, though that was because he was lost in his own head. He leaned over towards the window, spotting Toru and where she gathered her team. And also where one of the raccoons was dragging a very long rope. He grinned. Well, 
the top spot will go to either Momo's team or Toru's. That strategy is genius. Oh. Nezu tapped the table with his paw. Do go on. Toru is going to float above the arena using Okako's quirk. He started cackling, in unison of Nezu's laughter and Yagi's terrified chuckles. Toru leaned over, puking her guts up. Apparently, becoming the equivalent of a giant beacon and glowing so bright to be blinding for five minutes was a bit of a strain on her body. After the laser she fired at Shouto to steal his headband. Right next to her, Yuriko was also puking, so at least it wasn't just her. Hitashi held up a couple of water bottles, and Toru eagerly grabbed one, chugging the contents down. You are my savior. As she said that, Hitashi patted her on the back. The crack of the whip distracted them all. And here are the scores. Midnight Sensei shouted. 4, Team Siro Hanta, Aitsa Tinya, Kiris Hima Ajiru and Tokoyami Fumikic. 3, Team Tokic Setsuna, Ponitsunatri, Kendu Itsuka and Honoki Juzu. 2, Team Yeyorozu Momo, Todoroki Shouto, Hatsumei and Yorashi Inaza. 1, Team Hagakure Toru, Shinsu Hitashi, Yuriko Okako and Jiro Kuka. We did it. Yurika asked, looking up at the board. We did it. Toru found herself pulled into a hug, a giant grin on her face. I showed the world that I am here. All right, that's where we'll leave off for the day. Thanks so much for listening along with me today. If you enjoyed please like and comment down below. It really helps with the algorithms. I look forward to seeing you next time. Ciao for now, lovelies.